So yes, this means we're live. We are live. Hello everyone, welcome back to the 2017 Twin Cities Film Fest, hosted by the shops at West End in the beautiful Showplace Icon Theater. We're upstairs at the lobby, right inside from the theaters on the Florida Junk Sponsor Red Carpet. It is closing night, it's 11 of 11, and we're wrapping the entire fest up with a really neat, quirky comedy. It is a fantastic little film. I'm your host tonight, Doug Sidney. We are here with the writer and director of the film, Colette Burson. Colette, thank you so much for being here. It's such a pleasure to have you on our Florida Junk Sponsor Red Carpet. Permanent. First of all, I love the cute quirky name, <laughs> which has perfect meaning throughout the story as well. Talk to us about putting together this comedy that is stepping right into the mind and world and the life of an adolescent and a family. Well, it's interesting uh, that you were mentioning the name permanent. A lot of people don't know that that actually refers to a perm. Like some people didn't know that that meant perm, and a lot of women have had perms. It's interesting, during the course of making the movie, I talked to a lot of women who had perm disasters, hair disasters. It seems to be very universal. Well, for sure, and that's a great point because everyone in the 80s knew what a permanent was. Well, exactly. Which was a while ago now, but you set your film in the 80s, so talk to us first about your story, and then I want to talk to you about how it's set in 1982. Okay. Yeah, it's set in 1982. I, um, but then also I do find that women sometimes, for whatever reason, got them, we're still getting them in the 90s. But uh, in terms of what my film is about, it's really, it's set in 1982, it's about a southern family, they're trying to figure themselves out, and their hair becomes the focal point of all their anxieties and insecurities. And in that way, the film also is about how it's very funny and yet very not funny, how hair is much more than hair a lot of the time, particularly in the South. Particularly in the South. Yes. Talk to us about stepping into that specific subject matter because you had to enter yourself into the world of hair. Did you have background with that? Did you have friends, family with kind of a familiarity with that? Because you're writing about it specifically setting your characters in that hair world. Well, I knew a lot about uh, being in the South with a bad perm. Way too much about being in the South with a bad perm in 1982. So, um, 1983. So uh, I just had a lot of experience with it. Everybody I knew had a bad perm, and I had a bad perm, and it was very traumatic, and so one day I just began writing about it in a way that I never thought actually would get made into a movie. It was kind of an act of creative rebellion. I just thought, I think this is really funny, so I'm just gonna write it. And, uh, and then it just went on from there. Good for you, you followed your heart and your instincts, and your, yes, and your creative, <laughs> yes. 1982, talk to us, you're creating a particular challenge for yourself because you're setting us in a particular point in time, everything has to match up with that. So that's a challenge. Talk to us about putting that together. Well, I was really lucky to shoot in Richmond, Virginia, actually, because Richmond is unusual. It's a city with a lot of uh, history. So you walk down one part of the street and it looks like the 1890s, and you walk down another part and you see a sign that is very like 1960 or, or 1920. So I was shooting in that place, faking it for small town Virginia in 1982. And uh, it looked very familiar to me. It was, it was very hot, it was very humid. Um, I think now sometimes about that shooting this film, which I did last summer, it was kind of like a weird dream, you know, and, and sort of moving away from this world of, you know, the Facebook, internet, media, it, it really did feel like going back in time. And then the fact that we were doing it on an indie budget, which meant air conditioning wasn't that great, you know, so, so it really felt, it really felt like going back in time. On an indie budget, you're no stranger to the independent film world, you've done it previously, but in most, if not all of your projects and all your work, the talent that you have secured into your projects is amazing. You've worked with Minnie Driver, you've worked with uh, Thomas Jane, you've worked with Rain Wilson, you've worked with Patricia Arquette. Talk to us about not only landing that kind of talent, but then working with them. Uh -huh. um, well, you know, I think that all actors are just really attracted to good writing. It starts with the script. And so uh, it's always um, just really having a vision and wanting to share that vision and getting people on board with what you want to do. And um, I have to say my experience with actors has usually been very, very positive. I feel that they often under a lot of pressure and you just have to try to be very calm and communicate how you see the scene, yep. how you'd like it to go, and 
and almost always like you know they they they're there because they want to do it too like they so you really get on board and create something um i mean you know like this shooting permanent we really wanted it to be funny and i felt like my actors gave me a real gift because they would show up on set i mean completely without ego when you see permanent I mean, kind of it's a comedy, but I think it's really fair to say that the performances in it are tremendously brave. You know, like Patricia Arquette is an absolutely gorgeous woman. She's beautiful. A lot of men tell me, oh, she was the woman I, you know, sat around and thought about, you know. And, uh, and yet she lets herself wear, like, you know, fatty shorts. They have pleats. They're walking shorts. She has bad tennis shoes, you know. And, and Rain as well. Like, they, they really took the comedic leap for the show in a way that I think is really great. And I think, you know, when I look at Permanent, I haven't, you know, I myself, I hadn't seen it in about six months until really recently. And I I recently saw it and I just thought, wow, it's, it's such a whole, it's an entire world. Like you really feel like you're back in 1982 in the South with people who are themselves with no self-awareness. You know, there's no, there's no hashtagging. They just are who they are. Such a wonderful response talking even about celebrities at their core they're artists and they want to be able to do great work and be a part of great projects of which you've been a writer for for you know, over almost two decades again with your characters in the film you also took on the challenge of working with an analyst and you centered much of the story around her talk to us about finding great child actors and bringing out the best in them because that poses it in and of itself potentially a challenge too well interestingly enough I, until you said that I don't think I fully realized that in most of my projects I have indeed had adolescents. Um, so I made a movie in 2000 called Coming Soon that had Mia Farrow, and that was really about me being, um, you know, a young woman coming to New York City and realizing how different the adolescents of my peers who had grown up in New York City had been. So it was kind of like my, whoa, what a different world they came from than I came from in the mountains of Virginia. And, uh, and then in Hung, uh, there were also, you know, that was the TV show I did for yep. HBO, yep. that also the, the lead character and, and you know, Thomas Jane and Anne H had adolescents, they had kids, and, uh, and that was a really weird experience. Um, it was wonderful, the, the kids were so talented, but that was also a whole, it was a, a fascinating experience because with television, you get a lot of feedback. And, um, and we cast them to be like real looking kids, not beautiful looking kids. And you would be really surprised the internet tore them up. It was always like, how'd this ugly ass kid get it? <laughs> it was really interesting, sure. really the, the criticism they got for being just yep. weird and cool, you know? Yep. And then now this one has an adolescent as one of the leads. Like I do think of Permanent as having really three leads. It, it's like this family hurtling through space. So it's, it's very much the Oralies, I call her the unfortunately named Orly. Orly's um, coming of age story, but then it's also the whole family in a weird way is coming of age. Like they're all sort of trying to figure out how to survive and, and, and hopefully a very funny way. One final bit of discussion since we have you here. We're so fortunate to have you here. Can you talk to us about navigating between the two mediums of film and television? Because we talked off camera about there's a, there's a bit of pressure when, you, when you're when you ready for television. Do you find that being able to step in and be a filmmaker and write a script for yourself that you're potentially going to be, you know, produce and direct as well? Talk to us about straddling those two lines, if you would. You know, there's probably a glossy answer I could give to you, but actually, I think it's hard to go between the two because a, a movie is such a time-consuming thing. I mean, at the minimum, you take two months off of your life, go to location, you go and you film. But really, you know, you have to, you spend like weeks making your lookbook and your proposal and meeting with financing before Transparent began. And then Alan Ball, he made an indie movie, but it was in between um, two of his projects. You know, but there was a big gap between. But it is, I remember when I was trying to get Permanent made, um, and there was an opportunity to get it made at the end of the first season of Hung, and I had like a month off, and I thought, you know, you just can't, it's very difficult to just be like, okay, TV job done, let me, let me do my movie job, like it's, you know, each one takes such a huge amount of time, so I'm trying to do that, I'm trying to navigate those tricky waters, but I don't find it simple. Let me put you on the spot one last time. I've uh, got you here, and we've got your audience. This is ready to go in and watch the film as well. Other than entertaining them and them being able to laugh and and identify with your characters in their film, are there any other takeaways from this story in permanent tonight that you would hope audiences bring with them? Well, you know, after I finished it, I thought, 
I hope I didn't just make a simple story. I hope I didn't just make, oh, a sweet little story about a girl who had a permanent disaster. And coming back to it after a bit of distance, I think that um, it's actually very, very complex. There's very, I'm saying some, you know, I think you yeah. see my artist's soul in the material. And so I think it really will strike people in different ways on a more personal level beyond just, uh, beyond just a comedy. Which is such the spirit of independent filmmaking. Thank you so much, Colette Burson here with Permanent, supporting her film, Closing Night. It's a comedy, you're gonna love it, here at the 2017 Twin Cities Film Fest, hosted by the Shops at West End and the Showplace Icon Theater. Thank you for joining us. We're gonna check out the, the film tonight. Colette, we love talking to you. Thank you.